Arthur said job. We're going to be doing some ink lines and some clear on this tape, we hope. If things go well and we don't get an earthquake or whatever. This is the original Nobla. The original Nobla from the Nobla videos. And uh, in case anybody's interested, the, the tapes are still available. They're not in super great shape anymore. We've run over 220 copies off of the Masters. But the information is still there. If you've never seen them, get your wife to buy you a set. Now, I just want to thank Frank McMillan ahead of time, who uh, is letting us borrow some of these photos. These are his personal photos from the 63 Nats. And these are probably going to bring back a lot of memories if you're as old as I am. From the 63 Nats, photos courtesy of Frank McMillan. Thanks a lot, Frank. Now, if you were at the 63 Nats, you know this is one of Les McDonald's... Uh, Oh geez, I don't know. I don't even know what to say. This looks like it looks like Moses Quintana's plane, or similar to Moses Quintana's plane. And it's always nice looking at these old photos to see where we've been and uh, who we're trying to copy. This is obviously from the age of jets. Right now we're going through the age of who knows what, the age of uh, decrepit old men. I don't know. Anyway, we have a stack of photos here. I'll show them right up front here. And I think if you were at the '63 Nats, this is going to make you cry. This has the look of Jim Silhavy's plane, but uh, yeah, it's Silhavy's plane. That's Silhavy's uh, AMA number. I guess he had two planes that year, I, although I don't remember. Now, speaking of Jim Silhavy, this is a funny story Billy Werwich told me uh, about Jim Silhavy when they were on the world team. And Jim Silhavy, whenever it would get windy, he'd say, oh, I'm not going to wreck the plane, I'm going to save it for a bigger contest. And uh, they were at the World Championships, and the wind started blowing, and Billy asked uh, Jim, he says, hey, if you're not going to fly, what are you going to save it for, a bigger contest? And uh, I, I really don't know what the outcome of that was, but it was one of Billy Rogers' favorite stories. Anyway, one of the master finishers of all time, Jim Silhavy. Just another photo of Silhavy's plane, and uh, I have to tell you, many times I'd be in the hangar, going back before 63 when I was uh, very young, and I'd go up to Jim Silhavy and say, gee, Jim, boy, that's, that's some beautiful finish. How do you do that finish? And he'd kind of put his fingers around his nose and say, a uh, lot of work. Well, Jim, thanks a lot. You know, that information uh, went a long way while I was a kid because uh, I was determined to uh, learn how to do finishing with your help or without it. Either way, uh, anyway, he set a hell of an example on finishing for us to follow. Now, this is Frank McMillan's first Martin Baker, first Martin Baker here, and uh, it's a beauty. And I got to fly this at the, not this one, the other one, at the, uh, let's go back, boy, I got brain damage, 83 or 85 Nats, I don't remember, and uh, this was one, one sweet flying plane. And I love the growl, brr, the wide open 60, you know, none of that muffled tune pipe nonsense. Men's airplanes, flown by men, for men, with deodorant. Keith Trossel's, Keith Trossel's ship. Now, the date on this is 1972. I don't know if these dates are accurate. It looks like they've just been penned in. Uh, yeah, the date is 72 on the photo. Neat ship. Kind of an air racer kind of plane. Jerry Phelps' ship. If you look real close, let's move this over. You can see the lead out's coming out the, uh, the opposite side of the wing. Jerry Phelps' ship from 1978. 1972 photo, he was the winner of the 72 Nats. Al Rabe, the Sea Fury, the awesome Sea Fury. Now, no name on that photo, no name on the back. Oh, this has the look in the back here of being, uh, looks, I wish I could read the AMA number. Looks kind of like John DeTavio's Falcon. Can't really get the AMA number off it, though. Bart Klopinski, Bart Klopinski. This was Dawn Cosmillo's ship. This was, uh, talk about good finishing, boy. Everybody in her, fa in her family could finish. They run a body shop. The whole Cosmillo family. Anyway, this was kind of a takeoff on Larry Scrinzi's Blue Angel and uh, had the same look, tricycle gear, whatever. Dawn Cosmillo. Mike Stott. Mike Stott's, uh, I guess this looks like a chipmunk. Maybe this is the original chipmunk. Who knows? Okay, everybody.
everybody should have their uh, VCRs cranked in, tuned in, dialed in, uh, have the beer ready, the pizza ready, or whatever. Put the wife to bed. Let's do video. Let's go to the shop. Uh, we do have some more pictures from Frank, and we'll use them on one of the future videos. And thank him again. Frank, thanks for all these old photos. They're really great. Okay, we're back at the shop, ready to go to work here. Just looking to see how our gold is drying up here on the number two plane. Ready to go to work. It's time. Now, the other day that we were working on this, we started the Letra sets. In fact, we only got one on, the 1993 in gold. We went through and sorted out our Letra sets into various piles and groups that we're going to use, laid out what it is we want to put on the plane, and we're going to try to get some of that on the video right now. Letra sets, ink lines, and pro possibly even on this tape, start the clear coats by according to how long this is going to run. So let's go to work. Time to go get busy. The next thing is we're going to lay out this. We just made a little pattern up here. Lay out the bird's eye. We're going to pick this up from where we, where we were in a previous video. Lay out the bird's eye, and then probably would, because it's such a small area, we'll brush it in in white. I just started brushing this in by hand just to see what it would look like. Uh, believe it or not, the eye of the bird is a, a kind of a difficult thing to do to get, get just the look that you want. Only thing left to do on a bird now is to uh, pencil in the break between his upper beak and lower beak. We'll do that with ink, but the paint, since the paint isn't dry enough now, this is not only been dry in a few hours, we'll, we'll work on that tomorrow. We want to try to get some Letra sets in this shield on the outboard wing. Try to get that uh, put into place today. And we want to do some Letra sets out here on the outboard wing, so uh, let's get started on them. Okay, just like we did on the previous tape, we're going to lay out a piece of eighth inch tape. Then we want to lay out, lay out, make sure we have enough letter sets to write what it is we want to write here, and uh, just one by one pre-release them, of course, just like we did on the video before. Okay, I'm going to real carefully burnish out the ones, pre-release them, one at a time, the ones I need, and then carry it over there and get them in place. Now what I've tried to do from time to time, I have tried to pre-release like 8, 10, 15 at a time and I go over there and then they start sticking to the wing and everything. I, I think you're safer, especially if you're just starting this out for the first time, do one at a time. I think you're just, you're just going to have better luck if you do one at a time. Okay. Okay, so we're just going to go back and forth, get one letter at a time laid out here. So there's the first of the lecture sets, and pretty much everything else we're just going to uh, follow in the same footsteps, following a criteria we laid out on a previous video and trying to look for little bad spots that we can kind of disguise or cover up with these. Uh, the tweener, obviously, is this is an in-between the BJ and the PM. That's where it got its nickname from, and since this is a prototype, uh, you know, we'll put the title on in small letters in case we have to go back and make some modifications to the next one. 
But uh, knowing Big Jim, this thing will probably work out well right from the get-go. And we'll, yeah, we'll certainly find out. You know, talk is cheap. We'll find out come Trim Flight Day. Now here's just a few thoughts. You saw how I laid out the tape and, and then worked from the right to the center and from the left from the left to the center, from the right to the center, and that gives you an even gap right in the middle, both both words being equal. Otherwise, how would you lay that out? It would be almost impossible to lay that out. Well, if you work from one side in and the other side out, it gives you a little bit of a head start. Also, as you go along, when you get to letters like the G here, you're going to have to clip the tape, of course. So if you go back and play that over a few times, you can just... If you can pick up these little techniques off the tape, it'll be just a big help to you. And now, uh, you know, you can invent, obviously, we're going to put some more writing in there and whatever. But lay it out ahead of time, and I don't think you'll have any problem. Now we're just going through one thing at a time. We want to get everybody's name on here that we want to uh, thank for their, their little special effort on our behalf. And certainly Midgley is one of them, Big Jim is one of them. And we gotta get my wife's name under the canopy here. Jeez, I gotta get Karen Karen under there. Oh my god. That's the next thing. Let's get Karen on the plane. So you gotta have fun with this stuff. You gotta think about it. What do you wanna say here? What do you wanna do, you know? Thanks to this guy, thanks to that guy. People that help you out along the way, put their name on there. Hey, give them a break, you know. If Frank McMillan was a big help or Win Paul or uh, whoever. Put it on there. It covers up uh, mistakes in the paint, if nothing else. find the people I really uh, should thank a lot like Joe Kay, he's my partner in the machine shop business, and John D. John DeTavio, uh, you couldn't want a better friend on the planet. And somewhere on uh, all of my ships since Buster passed away, I always put his little, uh, little memory for Buster here. In case you never got to meet Buster, you were never at the house while he was alive, that's Buster, my Siamese cat. So right about now, I try to look around for some balance. I'd like to get something out on the inboard tip. Look for some balance here. I still haven't got my wife's name on here. Uh-oh, boy, I'm in trouble. Anyway, try to balance this out. I like the way the gold shows up on the purple. And, of course, we have dark letter sets for anything that goes on the yellow. So this might start to look kind of cool pretty soon. I don't know. Well, we'll just grind away at it. we got a couple more hours, and we'll uh, you just redundantly do a over and over what uh, you know you can see what a mess things get to be you <laughs> you get buried in letter set sheets here anyway it's fun you get to thank all the people that uh, contribute to your program give them a free punch line here give them a punch even better This little emblem, it used to be on a tail of the griffin. It's a little Peugeot emblem, in fact. Now, what I want to do, I want to show how to put one of those on a nose. I kind of closed in on having as many letter sets as I want to have on here for right now, and I'm finishing up the ink. I'll work on the ink tomorrow, I guess. But I want to show how to put on a little, uh, make a little mask out of paper and rubber cement and get that little griffin guy right on the nose. Kind of an easy way to do it. It's a lot easier than doing it the way I did the bird. This way is good. I like to do this for uh, when you just want to get something on in a hurry. 
Now these uh, little Peugeot emblems, just take a piece of paper and slice it out with a brand new razor blade. I have a pattern, of course. There's the pattern. Slice it out. Get some quarters. Let's see, we got this, this quarters. Quarters of rubber cement is all you need. And what I've done is I pasted on the uh, rubber cement. I think you can see it here right on the side. Just smear some rubber cement right on. Let it dry up a little bit. And you take your little template, cut your little template out, spread it right on. I'll show this, I'll show this in detail as I'm doing the other one. I want to get something on the nose here, and I looked at a lot of different Letra sets and some kind of thing to busy up the nose a little bit, and uh, I think this guy is going to do it. Now, after the cement kicks off, it takes a few minutes to kind of press down all the edges, and this is just a temporary mask. Now, the cement that's left in the middle of the, the mat, it takes a little bit of practice. Certainly not in, let's see if I can get this on camera. Let me hold it up. You can kind of wipe right toward the corners. Wipe toward the corners and the extra cement will just come right up. And since we're going to outline this with an ink pen, we really don't need razor edges here. If you were doing lettering, trim lettering, well, it would be nice if you could do, uh, you know, a little bit, a little bit more razor edges. We're just going to spray this and do the final outline with an ink pen. You clean off all the rubber cement and usually you just go right to the corners. That's the easiest way I know of to do this. You know, and this is a chance for you to be creative, to pick up some little emblem off, uh, you know, whatever. My little emblem here was the Griffon. Was the Griffon when we built the VMAX Griffon. And I kind of liked him. He's kind of like a little lion guy, a little English guy. Probably the thing off a Jaguar car would be a, another good choice. Name your plane the Jaguar. Whatever. Okay, you get off all the rubber cement. Now that actually is a mask now. Now we can just set up a spray gun. I'll set some tin foil up to go around it and that'll be ready to spray. And all you need, this is ordinary typewriter paper, ordinary uh, Xerox paper, a brand new razor, kind of lay the pattern out. I leave that little piece of tape so that holds them in position. And you can just pretty much start at one edge, work your way around. See, the trick here is you're not really, these kind of, these kind of mats, you're really not going to get a razor sharp line on like you will with masking tape. Well, sometimes you do, depending on if you get the rubber cement down just the way you want it. But one thing you do get, you get a real lot of creativity in what you can do this way. In other words, it would be really impossible to bend masking tape into this sharp of radiuses. So by doing it this way, what it, what it gives you is like a little outline. And then you can take an ink pen. And I just kick the camera over here. Just take an ink pen, outline the edge after you uh, put a coat of clear on and clean off the edge. Can give you a lot of real neat ideas for uh, custom work that you might want to add. Now the one I remember the best was uh, Keith Ferguson had helped Jimmy Casal. Keith Ferguson's son had helped Jimmy Casal come up with that real intricate paint job with all the stars and stripes and everything. And they laid it out just this way with mats. And it was real, uh, real simple to do, not a big problem, but you have to outline everything with an ink pen. You're not going to get the razor edges. And when you spray this on, one of the tricks is when you're going to spray a mat like this, spray the mat relatively dry. Don't spray it with, with a lot of thinner in a paint. That'll keep the paint from bleeding under the edges. And again, this is just a chance for you to uh, experiment a little bit. If you've never done this before, go get out an old Ringmaster, an old Nobler, or an old Magnum or something. And uh, prep soil off the bottom of it, make up a pattern similar to what you want to use, and do a little test on that rather than run the risk on your new plane that you won't like, you won't really uh, like what's happening. Of course we're cutting up the table here, but so what? I guess you could cut on a piece of glass, I just don't want to disassemble a table right now. 
right in the middle of Letra Set ink mode. And every year for the two or three days that you go and do ink lines, Letra Sets, it just seems like everything is in chaos. Of course, what I usually do too is after I start spraying the plane in clear and I start finding little spots that need to be touched up, I can always add a few Letra Sets right up until the last coat of clear. I can always add a few ink lines or Letra Sets. I just don't have a sharp enough razor here. And you can make some real intricate little patterns here. This is just one other method, then there's the contact paper method. We'll try to show that in the future. Okay, now you have a little pattern. And we'll save this guy in case we want to put one of these on the number two plane or on the rudder or whatever. Always save your little, little patterns. All you need to do is just look down so you get the alignment. We want to get them both lined up. Take some some glue and just... I've already used M600 on this to clean it up. Get a decent coat on there. Don't worry about uh, being a little bit too heavy on the rubber cement. Make sure you get the alignment right. Now you got to let the rubber cement kick off a little bit. And you can put the guy right down, right in position. Another trick with rubber cement, don't let the rubber cement sit open for uh, indefinite amounts of time. Now I want to get the alignment right. Let's see, we're just about on the top. Even. I'll kind of lay this out while the cement is kicking off. You know, and you really don't have to be absolutely perfect, but it would be nice if we can get them real even. This one needs to go higher. And what's nice is the cement kind of holds it in position while you're working it. Now you don't want to press it down now because you want the cement to kick off. So we just have it touching in just little tiny spots here. Kind of line that up. Get a little Griffons in position here. This guy could come forward just a little bit. Look right from the top. And I'll pat them down in position here. Now for sure there's a lot of ways of doing lettering and Steve Busso has probably the most ways at his disposal right now of anybody I know. Okay, that looks just about right. And I kind of press that down while it's kicking off. You want to rub out, rub toward the corners. I just figured this would be a little bit better on a macro lens. Anytime you see a corner, corner up and you can always go back if a corner doesn't stick down go back and put a little drop of contact cement in here it just turns into chewing gum you want to get it get all of the contact off before you shoot this again when you mix the paint you want a relatively dry mix not a lot of thin it it's going to go down in here and eat up the corners because this really isn't black or thinner proof now. This is just to be like a spray mat. Now we can mask this off with the tin foil as we did in a previous video. If you haven't seen the previous video, you probably want to look at how we use tin foil. Always rub the tape on a flannel shirt, on a t-shirt. 
And again, this is just to protect the surrounding area from overspray. You don't have to go too far on this. The tin foil method that we used for masking off the whole plane in the previous videos, I'm I'm real convinced that that should be something we should write about in Tampa or Since it's Walt Prey's uh, original idea, I would think maybe he'd want to be the one to write about it, but I'll leave that decision up to him. Anyway, and we'll mask off part of the wing, too. That's about all the mask you need to, uh, to do the spray job here. All right, so we're going to mix up some white, make it relatively dry. Dry is the key here. Double the extra amount of pigment because this is a little, a small area and not the whole airplane. We're going to double the amount of pigment in the plane, in the plane, in the paint, and just just spray this on as dry as possible to get some adhesion. If you have the extra white pigment in the paint, you'll have no trouble with coverage. White right over purple. White over black, it won't matter. Don't waste your time trying to do this without extra pigment in the paint. Now we have to let that dry thoroughly, and maybe we'll even let it dry overnight, and then peel off the rest of the rubber cement around the edge and card the edge down with a credit card, and then we'll be ready to start uh, doing a little custom ink lining on it. Speaking of ink lining, I want to set up a pen, get started on some of the ink lines right now. Okay, a couple of things about ink lines. One of the things you need to have, you need to have drafting pens. The pens that normal ink markers that uh, you buy in a store usually don't work 99 times out of 100. This, <clears throat> this is the kind of ink, you notice it's made for acetate, for drawn on film. This is the ink, and, it, and this is much better. It's actually waterproof black India ink. Normal India ink will work. This will work better. And again, you need to prep all the surfaces down, get all the fingerprints off, and rub and scrub the surfaces with a little bit of talcum powder to prepare them for, ha for accepting the ink. If you just try to write with ink on just normal shiny paint, it usually doesn't work. If you want to do some silver ink lines, this is what you have to do is get a pilot, either silver or gold. They make silver, gold, or bronze. You can get several different colors. I think I even still have a bronze one here. Oh yeah, here's one. No, no, that's another silver. All right, but anyway, these pilot pens they will write lines, but the lines are relatively thick. But what you can do is drill a little hole in the ink supply and put this ink into a, a drafting pen, and then you can get a, th a thin silver line. Uh, Lou Dutko was the one that originally came up with this idea. And again, uh, it works very well on dark colored airplanes. We're not going to put a lot of ink lines on, but the few little hatches or covers, you just go get the Pilot uh, brand silver marker. These have an extra fine point. I have some with a really wide point. But they do work well, and you can spray the clear right on top of it. If you make a mistake with this, by the way, the M600 takes it right off. You can take the ink lines right off the plane. Normal ink, the other ink, will not be taken off. You have to use alcohol. Alcohol on the black acetate ink, and prep salt for the, the silver and gold ink. 
Now I bought a couple of these these razor point pilot things in different colors so that uh, just if I wanted to do some little touch up work or some little detail work I went out and bought a bunch of them. I also bought some of the fine line opaque paint markers oh, and we're going to try some of this. If we have some bad spots on the plane it's always a good idea to have some of these. Oh here's the copper one, liquid copper opaque paint marker. Again, this is this is an area where you can be creative. Now if you don't have a set of drafting pens, uh, usually a set like this is fifty, sixty dollars. It usually includes some very thin line, some very thick line. You're going to need the thick one. You're going to need that for possibly outlining like the little griffin and the lettering and the thin one for doing detail work and maybe some lines around a canopy or some lines on a bird. Now, you need to be real careful with these pens. Clean them with Windex when you're finished. Windex and alcohol is a good cleaner. You need to use only the acetate ink. And you need to handle these pens carefully. If you buy one at a time, they're $12, $14 each. And you need to practice. Go practice on some paper before you go uh, gooshy up your plane. Just, just show this on the video. I went and bought this ink. Uh, waterproof black drawing India ink. No good. Not a good choice. The acetate ink is ten times better. Try to find something better than this if you're experimenting. I tried Higgins white ink. Forget about it. A waste of time. As soon as you spray lacquer on it, the ink lines seem to disappear. I tried decanting this even and putting more pigment in the ink. Still no good. When you get to that point, you need to uh, go to some alternative method. I have not found a good white marking pen yet. If somebody finds one, Hey, send me a sample, call in with the tip, and we'll put it on the video. Just looking through my box of junk here, I found a Pilot Gold pen, Super Gold. The Pilot is the best brand if you're going to do these kind of pens. Again, my suggestion is, since you're going to be doing the same thing over and over, get yourself a shoe box or an IBM card box. Save all your, your ink pens, and you're going to want to buy some of these drafting deals that have letters and some have symbols and some have this one is for architecture uh, whatever and you're going to want to any any surface that you're going to want to use you're going to want to put an eighth inch piece of tape around it so that this sits up off the surface and the ink doesn't run underneath if you try to press this flat down on on a surface and draw around it the ink will run right underneath it you're also going to need a ruler and they sell drafting supply rulers here I have one over on a wall it has a cork back. And this is the ruler here. You notice it has a cork back. The cork back keeps it from slipping and sliding all over the place. These are expensive, but they really work well. Now, what the cork does, I want to show this, I want to show this on the macro lens, that it really keeps, you need to keep the surface of the ruler or the template up off the paint so that the ink doesn't run underneath it. If, it's, if, this, if you used it this way, pressing down, you would get ink every time. It needs to go this way so that that little lip underneath just holds it up off the surface. Now from our set of ink pens, I've taken a zero. This is a 35 mm pen. And I just want to see now, most of the time when you leave these sit for a year, they don't write. This one happens to write. I've lucked out. But it makes a nice thin line. Okay, so we have ink in there, and of course it's the right ink. It's acetate ink. And just as an example, we have a thin pen here, and a. you can see the, th the difference. This is a thin line. This is a thick one. So you get all kinds of all kinds of variation in line thickness. That's why you really should go out right in the beginning and buy a set of pens. In our case, all we need is a thick one and a thin one. And we're using a, a .80 and a .35. With these two pens, we should be able to do all the ink work that we need. Now you notice some of these templates, these little drafting things, have a raised edge. So you can, you can really draw a, a circle or whatever around it. Okay, and ink doesn't run underneath. Okay, we're just doing this on paper now, just to, just to give a little demonstration. Well, the first ink line that we want to do, we want to go over and put the bird's uh, mouth in with ink, and so we can just go right over there, take the template, and ink in the bird's mouth. And this is just a typical line now. You do it with a curved 
curved template. You can kind of lay it out, whatever you think is going to look good here. I just move it up just a little bit. And of course you let the ink dry. Now here's our raised rule. Here's another thing you do with ink that you really you really can't do. Now see how uneven that edge is when I um, and I'll take an ink pen and just put a perfect edge on it. Peel the ruler back. You can lay the same thing out here. This lets me get perfect edges. This is what we're going to have to do to that little griff on up in the nose. Is put all the edges on in black ink. Again, using a fine pen, you can do all little detail work around the eye. Some of the little spots here, you can clean up all the edges. Again, this paint is still wet, so we're not going to go crazy on it. Put a few little detail lines out in the bird's feathers. is after we spray this with clear we're going to have to go back and touch it up in spots so there's no point in absolutely making yourself crazy right now just try to get it as nice as you possibly can get the look that you're looking for the detail work you can do in the next after the clear is on the next time around yeah he's starting to look like what we uh, what we hoped for all right, we're going to go over and work on a shield now. Now, what we're going to do is transform this shield into uh, checkerboards, really. And to do that, you don't want to use masking tape. You don't want to go, uh, <laughs> there's a lot of ways to do checkerboards. The way I'm going to show you with the ink pen is the way I've used on the last few planes, and it works real nice. Now, last year's ship, I had a checkerboard up on the uh, under the canopy. And I had one on the rudder this year. It looks like we're only going to have one up on the wing and the two on the bottom. But to do those checkerboards, we do it with an ink pen. You need to paint it white, and you need to do it with an ink pen and a ruler. You need, what you really need is a machinist ruler. Now, it's been a fad and stunt for the last couple of years that everybody has to have some checkerboard somewhere on their plane. And uh, we don't want to be left out. Heaven forbid we should be left out. It's bad enough that we... Uh, <laughs> We've missed a boat on other things over the years. So let's put some checkerboards on the top of the wing. Okay, the first thing we want to do, this is a machinist ruler. We want to see how big we want to have the squares. This looks about right. This is the one we used last year. So the first thing is let's get some eighth inch tape up along the edges here so that the ink doesn't run underneath it. Now, this is how I make a little checkerboard rule. Now I put two layers of eighth inch tape on the bottom so this will hold this up off the edge keep the bleed through to a minimum. You know, you could you could make bigger squares or smaller squares, it doesn't matter. But in the meantime, you want to start with the thinnest pen you have in, in inventory. Let's get a thin pen and let's get a piece of paper. I always keep a piece of paper here so when the pen doesn't want to write, you can go by and, and write. You want to use the thinnest lines possible. So for, for our purposes here, we're just going to connect the dots, the point and the point. We're going to kind of hold the pen straight up and down. Put two dots up there, that's our center. Now what I need to know here, I want to just eyeball this, I just have to do this by eye. I want to get this part up. Okay, since this is an eyeball, Let's make sure we don't have it crooked. Uh -oh. 
<clears throat> now another thing too again I'm just doing this by eyeball this is not a not a thing I want to spend all day doing if you get a little bad spot in the letter set and I just knock this with my fingernail you can you can kinda touch up the letter sets with the pen there's no reason to put on a whole new letter set just touch that right up again the things that are important to make sure it's prepped all down now see I'm gonna walk my finger out this way and then do the other side now what you need to do is just let that dry give it a second or two unless you have real good reflexes try to pull it up without smearing it and we'll just go right down to the next line yeah I guess by now you can figure out how we're gonna do this Put Bill Suarez right out of business. I guess Suarez is the one that deserves the credit. I didn't ever even thought of it for uh, the the rage to checkerboard. I personally don't like the things, but anybody that knows the stun event knows you have to stay trendy or uh, you lose points. And then with Walker's playing with all those checkerboards and his checkerboard pants on top five day last year, God, there'll be a run at Sears Roebuck on those uh, velour pants. Can't wait to get my pair. Okay, and you can pretty much figure out we're just going to, we don't even need the last one. Let's just see if we need the top one here. Lay out all the horizontal bars. Now the biggest thing here is don't get impatient and try to run the uh, the vertical bars until you have these finished, or you wind up smudging the ink, like I just did. Yeah, I didn't have it on. So that really doesn't matter because if you smudge it, you can take it off with Q-tips and alcohol. Okay, we'll give that a minute or two to dry, and then we'll do the vertical bars. Now it's funny, Bill Rich called me one day, last winter when everybody was going crazy out checkerboarding each other. Thanks to you, Suarez, anyway. And he had done it with uh, masking tape and paint, and he said, oh my God, what a lot of work. And when I told him about this method, he liked to have a heart attack. He said, oh, thanks, thanks, thanks. So, just mail a check, Bill, that's all. Check made out to Wendy Ertnowski. All right, and you can, if you're real careful now, you can just go right down. One of the tricks is to try to keep the pen straight up and down as much as possible. Another trick is try not to press, just let the ink flow out. If the surface is clean, it'll flow right out. And of course, we want to be careful around these letter sets. They're not... Uh, they're not sealed and clear yet. Now, when you go to do the first box, you're going to black the box in. Oh, we got a phone call. Hang on. Just Karen checking up on me to make sure I'm not out at the go-go parlor. She should know when I'm in building mode. There are no, no distractions. What's nice about this little technique, you can use this, and I was about to say with Bill Rich, he wanted to make a rudder checkerboard and it wound up taking him three days or something crazy like that. Then when he figured this out, he was just so happy. And so you can uh, figure it out on your own where you might want to use this in your trim scheme. In fact, maybe we'll do that Griffin in checkerboard, smaller checkerboards. Okay, and it's, it's no more difficult than that to do nice checkerboards. Now, you want to get out the big pen. Now, as I was saying before, let's get the pen started. These pens, are re they really are a nuisance. I'm glad I'm not a draftsman. hate these things. 
look around for a box that has an uneven line, and it's the one that has an uneven line. Why I'm talking about that, I better get my glasses on too. Now, last year my eyes have really gotten bad. Look for a box. Now, this one up here has a, a bad little line, so we'll turn this into a black box. And if you're patient and careful, you can just come right up to the thin line. And if you happen to go over it, you can get the ruler and make the correction. Just go back over it a little bit. Another couple of thousandths of an inch. And this is why you need a thick pen and a thin pen. Now this is a thick pen. Okay, so you pretty much can figure out the rest of the puzzle here. And if you had the colored pens, now you could you could say you wanted to have a red and white checkerboard. Well, you could go get a red ink pen. Okay. Now when you're all done, you really have to get in the corners with the fine pen. And there'll be little white dots here and there. But I hope that way allows you to get some checkerboards on your plane. If you want to go with the flow here, go with the Walker flow or whatever. The Suarez flow. I don't know. This will allow you to do it in a matter of 15, 20 minutes. You'll have checkerboards on your plane. Okay, and when we do the, bat the bottom, it's the same old story. Nothing different. Get out a little bit of the... Uh, to make it a lot easier. This side doesn't have letter sets. Scrub it down a little bit. This is M600 and this really helps getting the ink lines to stick down. Now we're just going to pull this over and do the other one off camera. See what that will about probably finish it for today. And we'll finish up tomorrow. I guess we're going to work on this guy tomorrow. Work on that, uh, that little griffin emblem. Finish the rest of our letter sets and ink. And uh, as soon as it's all finished and ready, then we'll start to clear. Okay, I finished up the bottom checkerboards. I want to take a little Gorham silver polish and get off the, the last little bit of rubber cement here and it cleans up the edges a little bit too. And the last step is get a little Sickens M600 on there. And we can work on that for the rest of the night. I always liked the way those checkerboards looked when uh, when I gave the other yellow plane to Midgley and you see it in a even in a video you could see those checkerboards. All right, so we're going to start work and try to get an ink line around the edge of this guy and then uh, detail him out. I just, just free-handed in a little uh, outline with the uh, black pen, the wide one.
Now, in the last couple of days, I've had so much work to do on this house, I haven't had time to really keep up with this. What I did, though, I wanted to get this on the video, is I took... Now, these are rough edges. These are very rough edges where the metal flake ends and the silver begins. They haven't put any clear at all on this yet. But what I've tried to do is I've gone down with an ink pen, and with the ink pen, I've just tried to knock the edge down. Rather than trying to sand it, I put an ink line around it, and it seems to knock the edge down just enough. Now, I'm going to do the outboard panel later. And I worked on uh, our little guy up here. I don't know. <laughs> Jim Damarell was over the house the other day, and he didn't like him at all. He says, ah, no good, no good, no good. Kind of like him. A little, fr little friendly guy. Anyway, we did some letter sets on the back of the fuse. Just some little thank yous for people uh, gone but not forgotten. I try to always include on the, uh, the airplane the people that have helped me over the years and people that are continuing part of the Pro Stunt team, of which there are many. Anyway, I'm going to try to finish up this lettering here if I can with the ink pen. And starting Monday, this is going to be a dollhouse weekend. We're going to a dollhouse show. Starting Monday, uh, I anticipate we'll finish this up and get the clear started, and I really am looking forward to that. Now today one of the things we want to do is put on a, just a few silver ink lines and I want to show the technique for making silver ink lines. Uh, you'll probably be pleased to see how easy this is to do it, uh, once you figure out all the little tricks. First thing you need is a pilot silver marker and I want to show the label here. This one has an extra fine point, blah 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 blah, blah. whatever that is, uh, it's not a problem. These you can buy in any art supply store. They're uh, not not too expensive. I'd say three to five dollars, depending on you know what the markup is on some of these art supply things is ridiculous. But the the brand you want is Pilot Silver Marker. They make gold, by the way, and brass. So you may want to get a gold one and a silver one and uh, do a little experiment. Now, because this is a a dark color, you know we can do black ink lines back here. But we need to do a light color up here, and I think the silver will coordinate with the striping on the lettering just about right. And one thing you're going to notice right away, if you want to do thick ink lines, and I'll try to do this on it, you have to press down on the tip of the pen just a little bit, but you do get a blob, it's not really neat. But from that point on, once you get the pen started, you can make relatively nice lines with the pen intact just the way you buy it. Okay, that's that's one thought here. When you have a dark colored plane and you want to do some fancy lettering or ink lines, outline things, do a stripe in between, this is a good source. Now if you mess up for whatever reason and you need to take this off either your hands or the airplane, good old M600. That's our best our best friend here, M600 Sickens. Sickens will take that right off. It'll clean your hands. Now, but this is only step one. Now, this, this gives you nice fat lines. What we're going to be looking for, hopefully, what I did, I took a drafting pen, good old uh, stead ladder drafting pen, took the ink out, and replaced the ink with the ink from the pilot pen. Now because I still have I still some black ink in there I'm going to just run some random lines here until it comes out all silver until I flush out the pen. But you can see how much thinner these lines are than these lines. Now to get the ink in the pen it's a simple matter. You take take the pilot pen drill a little tiny hole up here which I've already done that I've taped over it. Then you want to take all the ink out of the pen, the ink comes out with a Q-tip, turn this completely upside down and the ink will not run out now. And what you need to do is just press on a tip one drop at a time and one drop at a time of ink will come out of the bottom of the pen. 
Whatever you get on your hands, go get the Sickens M600, write it right off. Tape up the pen because you'll have enough in here to do 10 aeroplanes from one pen. And now you have the ink in a drafting pen. And you're going to have, you'll notice this, that you can make some real nice fine lines. Any place you put ink on a plane and you want to get it off, you're not happy with it, it looks sloppy or whatever, you, you whatever reason, just go get the Sickens M600, clean it right off. Now you could also repeat the same, all the same things with the liquid copper, same thing, drill a hole, put it in if you want, get the ink out. This gives you kind of a coppery ink line effect. But again, the line from the pen is just too thick. That's the only problem. Now you can also buy Pilot Razor Point. If you want to do real tiny detail work, you want to do little tiny rivet heads, little fine detail work. And again, I like to make the thickness of the ink lines completely different so that they're not all the same. I don't like to take and make all the ink lines thick or thin. You want some thick ones, some thin ones so that you can give it give it a, a, a variety of uh, textures or whatever you want to call it. You don't want it to all look the same like you just took these out of a, a jar. This is a good, this is called a pilot razor point. Two to three dollars for these pens and of course we're going to be going over this with clear so it's not a, it's not a problem if it's fuel proof or not. Now, any ink that we put on with a ruler, the most important thing is that you have a nice surface like, you know, I can't even make the surface flat. doesn't matter what color it is. It should be flat. You haven't put any ink lines down. Clean it with M600, get all the fingerprints off. If it's still not to your satisfaction, rub it with some talcum powder and wipe the talcum powder off. Now, you need to have a ruler that's shaped like this. I've already shown this on a video, but I just want to reiterate it. I'm going to exaggerate it. Because what will happen is, the ink, when you draw this line, the ink is going to want to run underneath here. So you need to have a way, if you're going to use a template, you need to put some eighth-inch tape here, usually two layers of tape. If you don't use tape, you can use artist, artist quality rulers. This one, you can see, has cork on the back. Now, if I want to draw this line, for instance, it doesn't let it run underneath. And you can just go... Bing, 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 and finish. Now, another thing, let's just make an example up. I want to give some typical examples of, here's a wing panel, a flap. Most of the time, this is what you're going to want to do, is you're going to want to put an ink line on. What I like to do is run a piece of tape front to back, run a piece of tape, eighth inch tape front to back. Now go and put in your ink lines and come right up to the tape, almost to the tape, whatever pattern if you want to make geodetic ones if you want to make X's or angle ones but go right up to the tape when you're all finished peel off the tape and put this ink line in and now it all matches and connects same thing with a flap lay a piece of eighth inch tape along the edge work your ink lines in whether they're whatever up to the tape and the last thing peel off the tape and just connect all the dots. That's a good way to lay out an ink line job. And you can see that's exactly what I've done on the Red Baron. You'll notice that the thickness of the ink lines, some are thicker, some are thinner, thicker, thinner. They all have that eighth inch outline that I talked about. If you want to put some boxes, a few decals from a little model car, you can see the flaps are done the same way. They're not all thick, not all thin. The Griffin has the same effect. It's like a, it's a foam wing with simulated ribs. Tradition has pretty much the same thing. It looks very difficult to do. It's not really that difficult to do. You kind of want to, what you really want to do though is before you start an ink line job is go figure out exactly what pattern it is that you want to do. Make a little drawing up ahead of time. Get a little idea in your mind about what what it is. Now this ink line job up along here is around the canopy. Whatever it is that you want to do and have your pens ready and have that M600 ready. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this flap 
Of course, these flaps come right off the plane. Take one flap at a time, and I'll do the bottom first, and I'll lay out the ink line pattern on the bottom first to see how I like it. And then if I change my mind, get out the M600 and just wipe it down. Again, another trick, and I haven't done this yet, I'm not going to do it because I pretty much have in my mind what I want to do, is make a little drawing, get one of the blank Steve drawings, even if you're not building a cardinal, if you're building whatever, and lay out your ink lines on one of the blank drawings. That's another good way to do it. Now, just one other thought, is I keep all my old pens, all my rulers, all things in boxes, of course, and another good, tr another good trick is buy one of every kind of pen you can find, but some of these pens, I'll warn you about some of them, some of these pens will do a beautiful ink line job and when you spray the clear on, the ink lines just will, will melt and disappear. So if you're going to use some brand other than Pilot, another good choice is obviously run a little test. Make sure that the clear is not going to make the lines disappear. And this is what I did last night. The last thing before I left, I ran a little ink line on here and sprayed it with clear just to see if... Uh, it was going to melt because I was using purple ink. You can't. I don't think you can see it in the video, but I tried using purple ink. Okay, so one of the things I wanted to do here, I don't know if I'm going to do it, is do purple ink lines on the back, silver ink lines on the front. I don't know if that's going to look too hokey. Uh, you know, we'll find out. But anyway, a little experimenting. Do the bottom first. Have the M600 handy in case you screw up. Make a little drawing of what your intended ink line should be. And if you don't know, Look at a real aeroplane. I mean, and don't don't just draw, draw an X's and O's and and make the thing look like a piece of drafting paper. Look at a real aeroplane. Go get a picture of a real Mustang or a real Bearcat or something, and see what the what the ink lining looks like on it. And uh, the panel lines, you know, it's it's pretty obvious what the panel lines would look like. If you're doing a fantasy plane, then of course you can make it up as you go along. In this case, this is a fantasy plane, but we do want to have a coordinated package. I don't want this to look like we just did this off the top of our head and without giving it any thought. Okay. Well, step one, I'm spraying some M600 on here and I want to clean off. Now, if you have electro sets like when you do the fuselage, you don't want to go over the electro sets with the M600. This is just to get the, the fingerprints off, make sure the table is clean, get all the dust off. and get some idea of, I just have a rough idea of how I want to lay this out. Not too sophisticated, we're not going to, do, we're not going to overdo the ink lines. Ink lines and letter sets, another golden rule, if you don't know how many to do, you do one less, not one more. Alright, I'm just laying out some eighth inch tape. And of course now is the part where you have to be, you have to be creative and figure out well, what do you want this to look like? Where do you want ink lines? It's a good idea to look through maybe some of the old videos, and I could recommend taking a look at the video album for some ideas on ink line jobs. We'll look at some real planes. Lay out some eighth inch tape. Right, what we have is the, uh, of course, this is why we do the bottom first. You don't start on the top. Number one, we haven't drained out all the ink out of the pen yet. You need to get a piece of paper here to kind of get the pen started. And this has the eighth inch tape on the bottom. Now in this case you really have to let this dry before you go on to the other step. This ink takes a little bit longer to dry than drafting ink, so we'll just let, we'll let one line dry while we plot out the next one. Now in the beginning while you're flushing out the black ink out of the pen, and this is why we're doing the bottom first, seems like it's a little annoying getting the ink to flow, but uh, in the past, when I did this, what happened is as I used up the ink and I got rid of all the black ink, it got better and better. And when the surface is shiny like this, of course, it's hard to get the ink to stick. So sometimes, and this may be one of the times, you'll have to uh, 
Just scuff it up the least little bit with some 1200 sandpaper. May have to do that. The paint is kind of shiny here. Now when we go to the top of this, I can see because this paint is so shiny, when we go to the top of this, we're going to take some 1200 sandpaper. This is why you do the bottom first. You get a feel for it and you see if everything is too shiny. Now typically with the uh, Black India ink, this doesn't happen, but with the silver ink, the surface really has to be perfect. Now, for right now, we can just pull this back. This is the bottom, so we're not going to go crazy on it, of course. Now what I'll do, I'll go get the other flap off the plane, kind of match that up. Now I just want to scuff this up just enough that we can see if we can get the ink to stick a little bit better. Not trying to remove material here or anything. Again, now, if we didn't like the way the ink lines worked out on this, if we were unhappy, we just had, I'm sure we'll be doing some eventually that don't work out. Little M600, paper towel, take them right off. Now, I'm just going to repeat this and see if it works, if we're getting a little better lining on the, uh, the, pe the paint that's sanded with 1200. Slightly better. Again, this, these lines do take time to dry, so you gotta really have to plan it out ahead of time. Now when a pen, the pen clogs up like this, and it tends to do this quite a bit with the silver ink, I'm glad we're seeing this on video because otherwise you'd be, you'd be thinking, oh no, I've got a problem. You've got to just keep shaking it until you force some ink through the tip. Now in this case, this looks like we have a bad pen here. I'm going to go get another tip to this pen. Here comes here comes the reason. The big big glob of junk. Now see the glob of junk, I don't know if you can see this. this can you see this on a video? A big glob of junk just came out of the pen. And now it's writing black lines. So we, we still have some junk in the pen. Again, even more reason to work on the bottom first. And when you see these mistakes firsthand, then you'll be willing to uh, accept the fact that it takes a little practice, a little time and effort to get a system down here. Now we're getting some silver out of there. And we're hoping at some point in time, you know, we're going to have this pen perfectly clean and doing real nice clean lines, at which point we'll flip it over and do the top. Now, another, a better choice, and this is a choice you have, of course, is go buy a brand new pen that's never had any ink in it. If you can uh, get a new pen, you'll eliminate this problem. You won't have to go back and do this anyway. But if you run into it, you want to know, uh, you know, as many ways of solving a problem as possible. And if you understand what's happening, it won't be intimidating. Now, it turns out there's still a lot of black ink in this pen, and I'm not happy with this at all.
And what we're doing here is just simulating what would be the bottom of the catwalk on a real airplane, on a Mustang or whatever. It might be time to pull this whole pen apart and clean the whole pen. Now, after looking at this thing for a while, I, uh, I was really not happy with the thin lines from the pen. The pen was giving me too much trouble, so what I'm going to do is just use all thicker lines and use the pilot pen as is. But uh, I'm glad I got that little idea on the video, uh, even though I don't think I'm going to use it on this plane. The thin lines and the pen, now what it might be is you might, and this, is, this would be a, a thing to experiment with, is try a medium-sized pen. Uh, not a, I was trying to do a zero zero. Try to do a, uh, a .35 or a .45. It may work a little more reliably. Anyway, we're going to use the pilot pen. I'm not going to have a lot of ink lines on this anyway. I just wanted to have some, just so I could show the technique on the video. Now, when you make a little bit of an error here and you get a little bit of extra ink, I just take a brand new scalpel blade and shave the corner. If you want to get points on the corners, this is one way to do it. You can just shave it with a little bit of a scalpel blade. Now, like I said, we just want to lay out a few ink lines here. This is the black pen. And if you're in doubt, a few less is better than a few too many, for sure. Now, when you get a little smudge, a little smudge of ink, which I just did on here, Alcohol and a Q-tip, so take it right off. Not too much alcohol or it'll take the paint off. Alcohol takes off the India ink, the black ink lines, and Prepsol takes off the silver and gold ones. Now, once you're satisfied that you have enough ink, letter sets, lettering, fancy stuff, thank you gods and everything all over the plane, and again, remember, I'm trying to keep this relatively simple. This is a very busy paint job, so I don't want to load it up, make it look like some kind of flypaper or newspaper or something. I want it to stay relatively classic, relatively simple, have a little kind of simulated catwalk, kind of a simulated cut between the uh, flaps and the elevators, a couple little details on the tail. Now, here's a couple of significant things. At this point in time, what I've done I had Jim Damarell here yesterday to give me a hand, and we did an accurate weight of everything before we put the clear on. Now, what I did, and this was very significant, I went and weighed up the mainframe, elevators, flaps, rudder, no hinges, no clear. It was 32 ounces. Now, I know in the past when I've had ships like this, uh, the best one I've had was a little under 30, and that plane came out to weigh 54 ounces. So... What I did, I weighed up the motor, the pipe, the spinner, that was 16, that brought me up to 48, projected, tank, 2 ounces for the tank, the gear 3 brought me up to 53, 
the tune pipe couplers and other stuff. The prop, 55 and a half. Now, I have 55 and a half with no clear. See, I have no propeller either. And they had the props in here, but they're the tip weight, I'm sorry. Tip weight, nose weight, whatever. So I'm saying when you add in the tip weight, the nose weight, this is going to come out just under 60 ounces. So you can see by doing this, I've done a little projection of where the weight is. An even better way to do it, and, and I know several people that, that do it this way, is they put the whole plane together. Mike Rogers puts the whole plane together, bolts it all up. And most significant of all is not the total weight, but right now, where does this ship balance? In this case, this ship, because it has the tail a little bit longer, this is an 18 and a half inch tail, and the tail is a little bit larger than normally. This, this tail is about 15 square inches bigger than we normally use. Uh, we're looking at a plane that's probably going to need an ounce, ounce and a half of nose weight. So what I'm going to do from this point on is I'm going to try to put the absolute minimum amount of clear at the back of the plane and get most of the clear up around the wing, top of the wing, leading edge. You can put all the clear you want on the nose. Bury the nose in clear. The wing, we'll try to keep a medium amount. Top of the wing, a high amount. And everything from the canopy back the lightest dusting of all. You've noticed I've purposely put very, very few ink lines, letter sets, and things behind the canopy so that it would take a minimum amount of clear to seal it all up. Now let's talk about this for a minute because we're pretty much ready to do the clear. Let's, let's sit down and look at some of the choices we have to do the clear. Now, one of the areas, one of the ways a plane can go wrong, and it can go wrong in a big hurry, is by putting on the clear too heavy. Now, let, just so we understand, and this is just a little brief dissertation of why this is a problem, putting the clear on, if we look at an airplane this way and draw an imaginary line at the CG, What you find out is 80 to 85 percent of the airplane is behind the CG. So what it means is the paint area, when you, if we were projecting that all the paint on this airplane should be seven ounces, if we had an all perfect world we'd want to have a seven ounce finish. Not many planes, uh, very few of mine come out seven, eight is probably more realistic. But what happens, most of that paint is behind the center of gravity. And it's because most of the paint is behind the center of gravity, when you load up on clear, you wind up with tail heavy. Now, this is, ex this is especially critical now because, because we've done that little projected weight. We put on all the letter sets, all the lines, decorate it all up as much as you want, do all your little decorations, do dads, d dads. Now, run off and get a little look at where the CG is. The CG is only going to get more tail heavy. As you put paint on, it's going to get more and more tail heavy for this reason. So if you start out right now and your nose heavy, if you start out and your nose heavy, well as you put paint on, the plane is going to get more and more tail heavy. We know that. But if you start out tail heavy, then, and that's the case where we are with this airplane right now, we want to really minimize the paint. And we want to do it in this way. If I look at the plane, everything from here back is going to have the minimum amount of paint. The tail, the elevators, the rudders. You notice I purposely didn't put a lot of ink lines on the elevator and stab. Now I wanted to have a bigger than normal stab. This is one of the experimental aspects of this plane. Because ships with a, with a large volume of tail to fly more, more and more stable the more you increase that tail area or increase the tail moment arm and we've increased both so this should be a, re a relatively stable plane and if we project up the CG all of this is going to be behind the center of gravity you really have to keep this in mind when you go and lay out the clear on a plane this is where a lot of perfectly good airplanes not only get too heavy they get too tail heavy. 
all at the same time. When we're talking heavy, we're usually talking tail heavy at the same time. And this is the reason. It's because 80, 80, 85 percent of that, if you were to weigh up or measure in some way the square inches from the CG back forward, you would find out that a tremendous amount is behind the center of gravity. Now a way, this is, this is a technique I use right now to figure out where I am before I put the clear on is I want to measure, and we'll do a pattern master because it's very easy, easy numbers. This is 11 inches, this does not include the flaps by the way, and this is 9 inches. This is a typical PM. And what you do is you measure the root and the tip and you take the average. In this case the average is 10. If you, if you had exotic numbers you would add 11 and 9 together, come up with 20, take the 20, divide by 2, you get 10. 10 is what's known to us right now as the mean average chord. Okay, and what we want to establish before the paint goes on the airplane is that our center of gravity is no further back than 15 percent of the mean average chord. When that plane has the motor, all the hardware bolted in place, right now with no clear 15% of the mean average chord. So in this case, that would mean the mean average chord is 10 inches. We we'll measure from the always from the flap hinge line forward. It means that eight and a half forward from the flap hinge line. And if we drew up an airfoil, this is the flap hinge line. This dimension here to the CG right now should be eight and a half inches if we were doing PM numbers and that would give us 15 percent. Now keep in mind that 15 percent is going to change because as we put the clear on it's going to go to 16, 17, 18 and probably wind up about 17 to 20 percent and these are good flying numbers. I always count this as being the most nose heavy, 20 percent as the most tail heavy. We'd like to wind up at 17 and then we could vary this Okay, so to make this little calculation, whether you're doing a tutor or a very exotic plane or a ringmaster, right now, right now, before the clear, let's let's set this up and so we know we want to be at 15% mean average chord before clear. And if you can arrive at this, what that tells you, if you put the amounts of clear on that I'm going to show on the next part of the video, you will wind up with a plane that doesn't need a lot of nose weight or a lot of tail weight. You will be in the best of all worlds. This is the number you strive for. Obviously, if you're not at this number, if you're already at 16 or 17 percent, it means don't put a lot of paint on a tail. If you're at 10 percent, paint away. <laughs> go put on an extra three coats of clear because you're going to need tail weight anyway and you might as well have paint instead of lead. This is where you tell right now how much clear to put on the plane. So let's, let's assume we're at 15 percent mean average cord right now. Let's assume for the sake of argument, and we're not, we're at about 17 percent the way this balanced up so we're going to cheat the tail a little bit. If you're at 15, you're in Fat City now. You're in great shape. Now you want to decide how much clear. This is always a question that, that I get asked every time there's a finishing seminar, every time somebody's at the shop, how much clear. Let's work it up for a 750 square inch plane. A little bit, this is a little bit bigger than a Magnum, a little bit smaller than a Pattern Master. This is kind of an average. For this size plane, Okay, two quarts. Two quarts of light coat or one quart of acrylic. Now notice when we do these amounts, light coat is more than double the amount of acrylic for this size airplane. And you can project down if this was a Nobla, uh, well you know a Nobla is 500 inches, take, take you know 50 percent less material. Okay, you notice though when you do acrylic if you put two quarts of acrylic on a plane, the thing is going to have a 15 ounce finish. And you don't want to put one quart of light coat because light coat, you're not going to have enough to buff out. 
Now let's do the light coat method first. And I'm not, I'm not going to deal with Imron or epoxy or K and B epoxy or any of that right now. Light coat. This is the method I would use for a 750 inch plane. I would take my two quarts of clear and I would take two quarts of thinner. This is V3608S. That's a DuPont thinner and this is clear. These are light coat. And I would mix all of these together into one mix. That's going to give me one gallon. You're going to have a gallon of mix. Assume you're going to spray this on. Two quarts of light coat, two quarts of 3608 thinner. Now this is going to be a relatively thick mixture. It'll be hard to spray this at 25 pounds a square inch. It's, it's thicker than we really would want it to be. So any time in this finish, we can add more thinner. The reason we make this first gallon thick is because from this first gallon, we want to spray at 20 to 25 PSI. And from this, we want to do a thing. We want to coat the letra sets. Okay, and fill the rivers. Where the trim is edges, edges, rivers, little gaps. And I went over that before when the, in the video when we pulled off the tape. From this thick mixture of a gallon, we want to go down and use. Now, we're going to have to go up. And this is the way I, I do this. I get three gallon orange juice jars. This is the easiest way I know of to do this. Even if you have to go and buy three ga one gallon jars. And I look at the glass jars. I pour the mixture. And it, uh, and it obviously doesn't fill them up. So that all the jars are equal. And now one jar. I take one jar, this means one third of a gallon, goes over the letra sets, edges, leading and trailing edges, anything, the canopy, anything that needs extra coats of clear to build up. Usually and, and typically that's one third of a gallon. Then what I would do, I take these two and this now is two-thirds of a gallon. I take these two-thirds, and this jar is now empty. I lay the three jars out again and divide it in thirds. So now I have two-thirds of the amount split into three jars equally. From this mix, I take one jar and spray the bottom. Usually you'll get three to four coats with that much material. I let it all dry, cook out, do whatever you have to. At this point in time, you could add a little bit of thinner here to thin this mix out, because you're only leaving it thick to clean up the edges. Thin the material out. Spray the bottom. All of the things you can see when a plane is laying on its back. One third. The two thirds that are left. Two thirds that are left. You want to turn the plane over and do the top so that the top has two thirds of the material, the bottom has one third. Now, the way I like to spray this is I like to do two coats and sand it with 600 and then put the last coat on with extra thinner. A little bit, maybe 10% extra thinner. Give me a nice wet coat to finish it out with. 600 sanding, no 400 in clear. 600 sand with M600, and we've seen how to do that on many, many of the finishing videos. The last coat, put a little bit of extra thinner, only 3608S. If at any time you're getting blush or the paint's turning to milky white, try adding extra thinner first. And if it still doesn't work, then you have to put a little bit of retarder. 
Be aware, extra retarder is going to mean the paint is going to take extra days to dry out, gas off. It's going to go down, melt ink lines. Retarder will melt electrosets. It'll turn electrosets into jello. If you're spraying with retarder, you better be spraying with under 20 pounds. If you blow on retarder, you're going to melt the whole airplane. Bill Rich has already melted a whole plane by blowing on high gloss thinner, high gloss and retarder. And retarder are pretty much the same thing. They're death to a stunt ship. High gloss thinner, because what happens as the surface is here, the thinner is going down into your coats of CA, loosening up the glue joints, loosening up all the substrate, the filler, the tissue, as well as gassing off. And less, less high gloss thinner will gas off. 3608S, almost all gas is off. High gloss thinner stays in the finish. It adds a lot of weight. Even though it may look prettier, it does add a lot of weight. Now this formula that I just have shown assumes a few things. It assumes that you're going to sand about, let's, let's say we get five coats of clear out of that mix. It assumes you're going to sand the middle coat with 600, and you're going to maybe, just before you put the last coat on, dress it down a little bit more with 600 and some M600, and then put that last coat on nice and thin. And when that last coat is on nice and thin, we're going to use 1200 paper and M600. And just buff that off with dope, you have to wait four weeks minimum, six weeks better, eight weeks best for that all to harden up because dope takes a long time to harden up. Acrylic, acrylic, maybe a week. Minimum, two weeks max. So you can see acrylic, you save time in the dry out cycle, so if you're sneaking up on the nationals and you want to get this thing buffed out, you might want to go with acrylic. Remember the difference is when you start the mixes early on, you start with two coats of clear light coat or you start with one coat of clear acrylic. Now if you decide you're not going to do a lot of sanding between coats and not going to dress off the last coat with 1200 or you're not going to buff it out, then just use one third less material. And if you do it this way, and you buff out the finish, when you're all done buffing it out, you'll see the clear has added three ounces to the total weight of the plane. And you will have a front row concourse winning finish at three ounces. Now that's why we weighed a ship before. Remember it weighed, what did it weigh? 32 ounces. Now when it has all the clear on it, it should weigh 35. What happens if it's 36? Well, guess what? Sand off clear. And the way you do that, you lay the ship out and you do the bottom of the elevators, bottom of the stab. Flip it over, top of the elevators, top of the stab. Now you know you're going to start going through in spots. But, you know, hey, do you want this thing to fly or do you want it to be pretty? And you can pretty much fine tune the CG back up to where you want it by taking the clear off of the tail. That's how I fine tune. Even after a plane is three years old, that green plane, I sand it off all the tail, especially on the bottom. Now it's still tail heavy, we'll start working on the fuselage. Bottom first, side second, top last. Still tail heavy. Work on the inboard flap, the outboard flap. Notice we're working our way up to the CG, getting paint off. At some point, hopefully it'll be right. If it's still tail heavy, cut off the elevators and go make up lighter elevators. Or or, you know, then you're at panic time. But this gives you a way to fine-tune the CG using the clear coat. And if you do this, and I know this is a, a lengthy thing to sit through, but if you, if you see this method and you use this method, uh, you are going to be so far ahead of people that just bolt in two ounces of nose weight, uh, you'll be writing me and thanking me. This is the professional way to do it. This is the way that works every time. And if you go over to the uh, wall there and you look, there's six airplanes over there. Only one of them has a half ounce of nose weight. Every other one has no nose weight at all. So, 
We're going to start mixing up our material using this method. We're going to use acrylic on this plane. We're looking to get kill some time. We've wasted so much time working on this house. We're going to do the acrylic method. I'm going to go mix up my batch of material and I'm going to start spraying in all the little rivers and ink lines this afternoon when it warms up. Okay, this is the material we use. It's a crystal clear process. This is as clear as water. It's not fuel proof. Now, this is no more fuel proof than dope is, and don't let anybody tell you SIG dope is fuel proof either. This is not fuel proof. What you need to do is take the clear coat, add an appropriate amount of Flexol. If you're going to use this or light coat, use the Flexol and use fish eye killer when you make your mix. Mix this up. Any thinner we're going to be using, you'll notice V3608S. This is environmentally friendly. It's used for 60 to 70 degree temperature. So what we do is look up at the thermometer and we're at 70 degrees. We're going to be spraying 70 degrees. We use thinner that says 70 degrees. Now if you were painting down in Florida, this might skin over too fast and you need to add a little bit of retarder. If you're painting up in Minnesota, uh, it's probably too cold for this. So you've got to adjust the thinner pretty much with a little test, adjust the thinner by where you are, what the environment is, what the temperature is. But this is the material we're basically going to be using. And we're going to go mix up one quart of this and one quart of thinner. And remember the old mix. We just not going to, if you go mix up two coats of this and spray it on a plane, you're going to have a lead sled. One coat of this is more than enough to do a professional, beautiful finish on a 750 uh, inch stunt ship. And you don't put it all on a plane if you're not going to buff it off. Put it... Now just to show the materials that we're going to use, this is the Flexol, this is Dave Brown uh, Flexol Plasticizer. We're using DuPont 259S paint additive. This only comes in relatively big cans, at least here in the New York City. Uh, so what I do is I buy this and I sell it in little jars. It's a little more economical. Since you only need one batch of mi one drop per mix, uh, I guess what the recommended amount here is one drop per four ounces. But anyway, having those materials in your shop, the fish eye should be in every batch of paint, the flex oil should be in every batch of paint, and especially in anything acrylic. Acrylic will tend to crack and tend to fish eye if you don't have that material in there. Okay, I have the mixture mixed up in a gallon jug. It's roughly a half a gallon. Notice I mark, mark the top what it is, and I would mark on here too, but I'm going to use this up right away so it won't matter. If I was going to put some of this in storage also, what kind of thinner is in here, and does it have the flex oil or the fish eye in there? Now, Midgley made up some nice labels, and uh, somewhere in the shop here, there, I'm going to see if I can find them. Anyway, Midgley had made me up some labels as to it, it would say what paint this was, what day it was opened, what day the thinner went in, what kind of thinner, flex oil and fish eye, and uh, somewhere in the shop they are. I'm not going to take time looking for them now, but it's a great idea. And uh, when Dave comes down, I'll have him run me some more labels, or I'll try to find these while I'm waiting for paint to dry. But the 380S you can buy in quarts. Uh, if you're going to do a lot of planes, you can obviously buy a gallon. But one quart per big stun ship is fine. If you use light coat, use two coats. Now you're set up to do the clear. You want to have the compressor. 20, 25 pounds max, 20 minimum. I cleaned out the tip of the gun, soaked the tip in thinner. Turn the adjustment knob, the fan spray all the way down. You want to do minimum thin, thin lines. I always have nothing but clear in the gun. This is a clear gun. Cheapest gun possible. Don't go buying $500 guns. It's not worth it. Again, we're going to go outside. I'll do a little test. A good thing to test is the rudder, the elevators, whatever. Set it down for a fine amount. Get the gun spraying just about the way you want. And then we want to go over all the ink lines, all the letter sets, all the lettering, piece by piece by piece, and the canopy. 
again, we're going to try to keep the minimum amount of pain on the tail. If we had a plane right now that was balancing at 10%, I would put all the paint in the world on the tail until I got that CG exactly where I want it. Again, that's a very good, reliable way to do it. Bob Gieske has told me that's how he does his noblers. He adjusts the CG by just painting them until they're 43 ounces. He never wants them lighter than 43. But anyway, we're going to do that. We have the gun ready. Let me go jig up one of the elevators or the rudder and see how we have the gun set. Now I just went outside and spray on one coat of acrylic. Look to see that I have the uh, haven't faded or changed the color now. There's a good point right now. Right now I see this is starting to fog up. It's fogging up because it's really cold outside so I'm going to do the rest of the painting inside the house here. Uh, when it fogs up I'm going to go add a little bit more thinner. Maybe one uh, tablespoon of thinner per four ounce uh, cup, eight ounce cup. Just a little more thinner I think will just do it. You just want it to dry up just to get rid of the fogginess. Now what the fogginess is, the fogginess is that the paint is skinning over before all of the thinner has evaporated, all the paint, all the, all the, the parts of the paint that evaporate are being trapped in by a layer and moisture is in there. You've trapped some moisture and obviously we don't want to do this. Now the choices are we can turn the heat up in the house, do all the painting in the house and I think that's what we'll do. Uh, another choice is to add more thinner or both. And we're gonna, this is why we always do a test first. Do the test, I'll test an elevator now, I'll test a flap. Don't go blowing on paint on the whole plane. Do a little test and get, you, get a fine tuning on that, the mix in the gun. Yeah, I would say we need a little more thinner. This is just a little foggy. Or you'd have to turn the heat way up, turn the heat up to 90. If you have air heat in the house, that's a good way to get all the moisture out of the air. Now we have the little tip weight box cover. Let me just move the main part over here. Have this little tip weight box cover. Now I'll give this a few minutes to dry. And let's see, let's see if this dries clear or if it's going to dry with a skin and with moisture in it. Now you can see here we're picking up moisture too. This is not dry and crystal clear. We're picking up moisture. So what I'm going to do is add a little more thinner to the paint, number one. Number two, I'm going to go up and turn the air up in the house so it's uh, maybe another five, ten degrees warmer and I'll wait till it warms up to do the rest of the spraying. Now you can hear the heat cranking away here. Again, I'm still testing little parts. I put about another teaspoon per thinner. Now as you add more and more thinner, you have to put a thinner coat on. You have to bleed the gun down. And you can't get to the point where you're getting runs in the paint either. Got the two little gear doors done. Now let's just sit a few minutes and see if these uh, dry nice and clear. Now the little gear doors dried up kind of nice. Shoot some clear on the cowling. Now the cowling, I don't want to build up too much clear on it because I am going to put a coat of clear Imron over the cowling. So I'll just get the minimum amount of clear on here. Do one or two coats, nice thin coats. Again, you notice I'm getting all my all my dialing in done while I while I'm doing little parts, not on the big mainframe part of the airplane. We'll wait and see what this looks like in five, ten minutes. Now I just put on another thin coat 
what happened with the uh, rudder, I wanted to see if on the second coat I could get out all of the uh, moisture in it. This, this looks like this was just fine, so we really didn't have that much moisture in the first coat. And sometimes if it's so milky and white, you, you just have to quit and wait for a better day. This looks like we'll just get away with it right now. So now that I've done this much, now I feel confident. I've got my mixture pretty well dialed in. I'm going to start doing the parts of the main plane. Now, it was so humid in here today, and I can't tell you, I didn't realize it was this humid. I really had to crank the heat up to 90, and I had to add a little bit of high gloss thinner to this. It's about 5% high gloss thinner, but I'm really running a high risk here. So what I'm going to do when I do the main frame, and I'm about ready to do that now, is I'm going to take the mix that has no high gloss, and I'm going to just go around the edges and the letters and the letter sets, let it dry, wait about a half an hour and then go by and put the uh, the mix on that has a little bit of high gloss in it. I don't want to take a chance on melting the letter sets here. And remember, I'm just going to go around the edges of the trim, the, the edges of the, uh, all the little fancy stuff, all the, the parts that would need more than one coat of paint here. Now we're up to about 22 pounds with this mixture, spraying at about 22 pounds today with a little bit of penetrating thinner. We fine-tuned this in on all the small parts and we're ready to start painting the mainframe. And of course when we do the mainframe we're going to start ventilating the cellar with plenty of fans and the heat way up to the moon. Now here's what I've done, I've added a little bit of this, this is a high gloss thinner, they call it a high performance. It's really a high gloss thinner. Now what I've also done is mark the jar. Mark the jar. I have some penetrating thinner, some penetrating thinner. What plane it's going on. 93 cardinal, some penetrating thinner. Some penetrating thinner. Ready to spray 20 to 25 PSI. You can see we we're at 22. I've marked my other jar, 3608S, because now I have the stuff all divided up into jars like I showed on the uh, the little schematic before we started this. I've got jaws everywhere and I'm ready to do the outlines. I'm going to do all the outlines. I've got it all blocked up on paper towels and then when I want to do the bottom I'll hang it from the lead outs. Always a good idea to have somewhere in the shop uh, a little hook you can hang it by the lead outs to do the bottom. This way you get all the, uh, the little things done at once. Again, just doing the edges here, just the edges. And this is the coat that doesn't have any penetrating thinner in it. This is so it doesn't melt the letter sets. I'm going over all my letter sets, all my edges. This will kind of seal the letter sets. All the stripes, the canopy. Don't forget anything that has the metal flakes in it, the micro flakes, is going to need several extra coats. Get the bird. Mr. Cardinal, so cute. I'm not trying to put a coat of clear on, I'm just trying to seal the edges.
these melt, of course, then we're going to have to go over them. I'm trying to get this first coat on nice and dry. Another trick, too. Don't put the first coat on super thick. The minimum amount you can put on here and let it dry. That'll seal it in. all over the floor here. Anyway, now what we're going to do, we have all electro sets done, is all the edges. All the edges get an extra coat. by the lead outs and do the bottom. Now I'm using the shop vac again as an air pump to blow some of this uh, fumes out of here. Give this a little time to dry before I hang it up by the lead outs and do the bottom. I've got all the edges done on the top, one coat. You can almost touch this now. It dries real quick when you don't have the penetrating thinner in there. Going, got this going, got the heat up to the moon. It's really inconvenient to paint in here, but this is the only way. Sometimes you just have to get these things done. You just have to force them through. It's funny, one of the guys, I won't mention any names, called me from Virginia and told me he has trouble with his sister-in-law. Uh, <laughs> she's allergic to dope. She complains when I, when I paint the house, so I gave him a real good solution. I said, just get a gun and kill her. As soon as the funeral's over, you can paint the rest of your life. There won't be a problem. No, just letting this bottom coat dry up now. I got it hanging by the lead outs. It's getting a little bit foggy, but I know when I put the, uh, the dope over this with the high penetrating thinner, that little fogginess is going to go away. So I'm going to give this a half an hour now. Then I'm going to try to get the second coat on this. Always handy to have a place in the shop you can hang it by the lead outs. Now we sprayed on the whole first coat of clear. We're into the second jar of the clear here. Shop back for air pump to pump out the air. We have a little more clear to put on the, uh, the little extra pieces like up on the nose and the canopy. As soon as we finish that, we're going to hang it up by the lead outs, put the remainder to clear over the, uh, the lettering, a little bit more on the lettering, and then put this guy aside to dry for the night. Now it's it's really important now to let this dry for a little while. We don't want to rush this up. We're going to give this at least two or three hours before we put the next coat on. Okay, we have all the clear, all the first part of the clear on. What we're going to do is uh, let this dry a few days. We'll pick this up on the next tape. We'll be sanding out this coat of clear, 600 paper and uh, M600, and then touching it up and doing the final coat of clear. So we'll end this video with a few uh, pictures. Then we'll use the rest of those pictures that Frank McMillan sent in. And uh, hope to see you on the next video. We should be able to finish up the clear and the buffing out. Most important part of all, the buffing out.
Well, we got a couple of photos here. These are the end of the photos from Frank McMillan. I'm going to mail him back these photos and thank him for uh, sharing these old photos with us. This is the 63 Nats senior winner. If you notice real, look at it real close, it's a push-pull design. It's a twin-engine plane. This is the 63 senior winner. Kind of a unique, neat-looking plane. Now this looks like, whoa, looks like Dave Gerke's plane here. Take a real close look at all the details around the nose here, all the little lettering, the canopy. Back from the jet era, when everybody was trying to make these planes look like jets. Nice three-bladed prop. Look at all the detail around here. I guess that ties in nicely with what's on the video. Now this is a picture from the Frank has written on the back 1970 Nats. I can't tell whose plane it is. I can't read the AMA number. Kind of a Thunderbird paint job. The old uh, Thunderbird jet paint jobs. Now another neat thing. Take a look at this. Uh, take, look real close. You'll notice the canopy opens up on this plane. This looks like, uh, uh, I can't really tell. It looks like Bart Klapinski's plane. Look up at the canopy. Real nice. It isn't written on the back whose plane it is. 1967 Nats. The caption on the back of this one is 1967 Nationals. Picture from the 84 uh, Nationals. Two of the fellows from the Japanese stunt team were over here and uh, one stayed with Doug Figs and actually gave him one of these planes. He didn't want to take it back. Two nice guys from Japan. Dennis Adamison's semi-scale typhoon. Looks a little bit like Harold Price's uh, Defiant, Bolt and Pole Defiant. Cool looking plane. Photo of Mike Stott's plane. Doesn't have the year written on this, does it? Uh, 78, 1978. Keith Trossel's ship, 1972. Well, he did a lot of work for Pampa. One of the instrumental people is setting it up and getting it moving and running. Jerry Phelps' ship, real cool looking. This looks like Gerke's Novi again. Slick looking plane. This is the plane Chris McMillan was trying to copy when he made his Golden Falcon. He was trying to copy the lines and the uh, Kind of a look at a canopy up forward and stuff. No name on this picture. Looks kind of like a stingray in the back. And kind of like a, an upright engine ship here in the front. <laughs> Gerke again. Thanks again to Frank McMillan for loaning us these old photos and uh, I hope we get some more pictures in soon for uh, these nostalgic beginning and ends of the videos here. I kind of like this way of beginning and ending the video. It gets you in a mood to do some work. Anyway, we'll see you again on tape 12. We'll pick up the clear coats. And until, uh, until you get your model finished and get it out on the flying field and get me some pictures and send me a paycheck and whatever. Who knows? May the force be with you.
Uncovered 200 rooms of course about is now one of the young kings. Also, descriptions listed in the biblical Samaria. 